If you live in one of these countries, prepare to get wrecked, because these places are going to get absolutely leveled in World War III. When people think World War III, they think of a full-blown nuclear exchange, but the truth is that in all likelihood a third world war will remain conventional since no world leader has a full-blown death wish for the entire human race. That doesn't mean a conventional war won't be absolutely devastating. All one needs to do is look at the war in Ukraine, which has devastated large swaths of the landscape, turning it into a Mad Max post-apocalyptic film set. This type of destruction is something modern observers are unfamiliar with, largely thanks to the precision weapons employed by Western militaries significantly reducing collateral damage. If the Ukraine war has shown anything, it's that the West expends a great deal of resources to limit collateral damage, though that's not pure altruism, precision weapons simply work better. But unsophisticated militaries like Ukraine and Russia's rely on mass fires to achieve their objectives. Recently, Ukraine's been receiving greater and greater amounts of precision weapons, but the bulk of its long-range fires and ground attack capabilities is still dumb. Russia initially had a larger stockpile of precision weapons, but these were always in low numbers to begin with and only growing in scarcity. To make matters worse, Russia purposefully uses its precision weapons against civilian targets, because for Russia, war crimes are just a part of war. And this isn't us simply slandering Russia, it's quite literally how the nation has fought and tried to win conflicts in the past. During both wars in Chechnya, Russia absolutely leveled the small breakaway republic, resorting to mass artillery fire to destroy stubbornly entrenched defenders. This is because the Russian military is fundamentally weak and incapable of the type of urban combat militaries like the US showed a high degree of proficiency in during the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Poor force structure, bad or non-existent training, and terrible doctrine all add up to create a military that's incapable of winning the door-to-door -door urban fighting of a war like in Chechnya, despite outnumbering the enemy by a truly staggering ratio. Russia's wanton and indiscriminate destruction is more than just making up for deficiencies in basic combat competency, it's also part of Russia's war-winning strategy. Civilians are fair target for Russian guns, because dead civilians demoralize the still-living ones. While the West makes an honest effort to limit civilian casualties, Russia's all too familiar with the terrorizing and demoralizing effect that mass slaughter of non-combatants causes in a resisting population. This is why Russia targeted hospitals in both Chechnya and Syria, and why it specifically chose to attack a theater in Ukraine sheltering families despite the word children being written in Russian outside of it. In the attack, it's estimated Russia could have killed as many as 600, many of them children. This isn't just a case of a rogue pilot, however, as the mass murder of Buka showed. Torture and mass killings are simply the way Russia fights, and Russian-aligned groups like Wagner are no different. In March of this year, the world got to hear the testimony of a Wagner fighter who recounted how he shot children as young as six under orders to exterminate all Ukrainian civilians they came across. When asked about it, he'd said he'd do it again if told to. Given that Russia is going to be a potential adversary for a World War III scenario, that makes it really bad news for any of its neighbors, who can expect the same exact treatment. Russia would be criminally stupid to try to launch a war against NATO anytime soon, but criminal levels of stupidity have never really been an impediment to Russian decision making. However, a more realistic scenario is one where a humiliated Russia is forced to retreat from Ukraine and lick its wounds. Much like Hitler's Germany during the pre-war years, Russia could bide its time and rebuild its military, and do it much faster than Germany did. Remember, to date NATO has forbidden Ukraine from attacking Russia directly, which means that Russian manufacturing and logistics networks have been left completely intact. It would be easy to scoff and point out the terrible performance of the Russian military today, disregarding their potential to threaten tomorrow. After all, the West has proven it has better equipment and better doctrine, and severe sanctions have effectively crippled Russia's ability to build modern arms. That would be a dangerous dismissal of the threat Russia could still pose to the West. The one lesson both sides has learned from this conflict is the absolutely voracious rate modern combat equipment is used during a war between two industrial powers. Yes, the West has far better and more capable equipment, but in dangerously low supply and dwindling by the day. The UK has between 700 and 1,000 Storm Shadow missiles, and while it's been tight-lipped about how many it sent to Ukraine, it is estimated that it sent about 10% of its stock at the minimum. The Storm Shadow itself is also in the midst of being replaced by a more modern and more expensive variant. Even while the UK defense budget is barely holding pace with inflation despite recent increases, the story is even more terrifying when considering tanks. The one weapon that both sides in the Ukraine war can't get enough of. 
Britain has about 157 Challenger 2s, as confirmed by a defense paper which showed it had cannibalized a good portion of its fleet for replacement parts. Like the Storm Shadow missiles, the Challenger is being upgraded, but the UK expects that due to the added cost, its total Challenger fleet will remain unchanged, and might even shrink. Yes, the West's weapons are far more capable, but when even a mid-range anti-tank missile can render an expensive Western tank inoperable, numbers suddenly matter a great deal. So while Russia might not be fielding T-14s anytime soon, it doesn't really need to because even T-72s through sheer mass alone would be a force to be reckoned with for NATO militaries. While NATO currently is motivated to significantly increase its readiness, the story may not be the same a year or two after Ukraine has been fully liberated and Russia is beat back to its own borders. Europeans have historically been eager to cash in on peace dividends and extremely reluctant to invest in their own self-defense. This places NATO's most vulnerable members straight in the firing line. And we're talking about you, Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania. The Baltic countries have historically always been extremely vulnerable to Russian aggression. And prior to the Ukraine war, many American military insiders feared that Putin would soon launch a fait accompli attack into one of the Baltic states. By seizing and holding a few small villages, Putin's invasion would trigger an Article 5 response. But would NATO really declare potential nuclear war over a few Latvian villages? Until very recently, odds were in the favor of the answer being no, likely fracturing the alliance as confidence in its Article 5 falters. Russia has no such illusions today, which means in our hypothetical World War III 10 years from today, Russia would launch massive numbers of older tanks and armored vehicles to face off against a few thousand strong NATO rapid response force. It's never truly been a realistic proposition that NATO would successfully defend the Baltics, especially as they would have to strike through Kaliningrad to get there. But the addition of Finland to the alliance means that it is feasible that NATO could actually muster enough firepower to respond to an incursion into the Baltics before they were overwhelmed. The old plan to simply liberate the Baltics might be out the window now, but it relies on one key thing, NATO stationing a significant amount of troops inside Finland itself. This is extremely unlikely. Given that upon the nation joining the alliance, the US stated that there were and would be no plans to significantly bolster NATO presence inside of Finland. This was a move to appease Russia, and it's unlikely NATO's stance on the matter will change even if there were signs of significant rearmament inside Russia. For all its strengths, NATO has one critical fault. It's a rational actor trying to deter a wholly irrational threat. Russia is not crazy, but it does act irrationally, and that is on purpose. Putin knows that he has leverage over NATO as long as he acts irrationally, forcing the international alliance to act, quote, responsibly. Responsible responses, however, have very little deterrent value, as evidenced by the complete lack of preparation for a Russian invasion of Ukraine, even despite the US sounding the alarm bell. Therefore, it is extremely plausible that a war 10 years from today would find NATO with its pants down again, putting the Baltics and Finland squarely in the crosshairs of massive amounts of Russian armor and artillery. If Ukraine's anything to go by, these nations would experience catastrophic levels of destruction. Even armed with lower quality weapons, Russia could still deliver a frightening amount of firepower to unprepared NATO defenses. Everyone likes to think back to the US's truly one-sided victory over Iraq in both Desert Storm and the second invasion. But what everyone forgets is that America had months to prepare for the action. A Russian invasion could come with little warning at all, and without enough troops to counter the Russian hordes, it doesn't matter how precise or efficient Western weapons are. Fighting would cause a refugee crisis in the Baltics, and probably even Finland. This would further complicate NATO's response as Russia is very good at weaponizing refugees. It did so in Syria, flooding Europe with refugees on purpose and channeling them toward rebel-held areas to sow confusion and chaos. With human life so cheap, Russia would give hordes of refugees one single choice flee away from the oncoming Russians who murder civilians on purpose. Meanwhile, outnumbered NATO forces would struggle to coordinate an evacuation effort on top of their military response, only making things worse for defenders on the ground. Inevitably, the cavalry would arrive and Russia stands no true chance against a combined NATO force, but the destruction it could cause in the opening stages of the conflict would be truly immense. And that is without the use of nuclear weapons, which would have such a global effect that discussing them in this video is largely pointless. Switching gears, the Pacific is actually the most likely place for World War III to start. While Russia is a significant threat, it's extremely unlikely that after losing the war in Ukraine, it'll be able to remain politically cohesive or even motivated enough to retaliate against NATO by biding its time. China, on the other hand, is prepared for war today. 
When we think of war in the Pacific, there's two obvious flashpoints, the Korean DMZ and Taiwan. Of the two, Taiwan is far more likely to spark the next global conflict than a North Korean invasion of the South. While North Korea loves to bluster, the truth is, they are no fools to the reality before them. Not only are they facing the might of the US military, but South Korea itself is heavily militarized and an extremely capable military. They may not match North Korea's numbers, but their technological advantage is significant enough to offset it. Taiwan is the most likely flashpoint for war simply because China has warned us of this fact. For China, reunification with Taiwan is a matter of not just pride, but survival of the Chinese Communist Party, whose legitimacy might be dependent on bringing the breakaway province into the fold. President Xi Jinping has made it clear that Taiwan will reunite with the mainland, even if he has to use force to coerce it. And the Chinese military has long been preparing to do just that. With Taiwan defended by the United States, which recently broke its ambiguity over a defense of the island nation, China knows that it'll be facing off against the world's most powerful military power. A strategy of denying the US access to the South Pacific, however, is China's war-winning play, and it could end up working. Either way, Taiwan's going to get absolutely creamed. China may be a more ethical actor than Russia when it comes to waging war, but we really don't know. The last war the nation fought was against Vietnam in 1979, and this was only a brief affair. We do know that the nation appears to have invested much more heavily into precision weapons than Russia, and there is always the fact that, technically, the Taiwanese are also Chinese, which one would hope would limit genocidal urges from Chinese hardliners. Then again, the Russians often talked of the Ukrainians being their brothers, and that didn't stop them from shooting children in the street. Geography, though, is often cruel, and while it's Taiwan's greatest asset, it's also going to guarantee that civilian casualties are going to be monstrous. Taiwan is a mountainous island, and its cities are extremely densely packed. This makes it an absolute nightmare for a Chinese invader who will inevitably be forced to rely on large-scale ground attacks to achieve effect against entrenched defenders. And once the fighting starts, there's not going to be anywhere for the Taiwanese population to flee to. The same strength that makes Taiwan so difficult to conquer works against it when it comes to moving civilians to safety. Even the mighty US Navy will likely take weeks, if not months, to safely operate near Taiwan's shores, forcing Taiwanese civilians to weather the fighting without rescue for half a year or more. It's possible China could agree to open humanitarian corridors, allowing Taiwanese civilians to flee to South Korea, Japan, or even the US. It is, after all, in its best interest. Limiting civilian casualties will help China's public image internationally after it's labeled an aggressive invader, and it also makes it easier for its troops to operate. However, Russia could have taken advantage of the same benefits, and it still chose to open fire on civilian evacuations, using the promise of humanitarian corridors to funnel civilians into a kill zone. Facing staggering losses in an invasion of Taiwan, there is simply no telling what a frustrated Chinese military might be capable of, especially when there is no track record to investigate. But Taiwan isn't the only place that's going to suffer over a war in the Pacific. The Philippines and Japan are both strong US allies, and places from where an allied response to an invasion of Taiwan would be staged. This puts them firmly in the crosshairs of everything from long-range Chinese missile attacks to special forces saboteur groups. The former is the greatest threat, with China holding some 1,500 long-range missiles which it could use to strike at airfields and military facilities across these countries. In fact, the US and its allies are betting on it. Inevitably, these strikes will cause significant collateral damage, and as the war progresses, China could make a gamble for victory. China's main concern in the Pacific is the United States. While the Japanese and South Korean militaries are formidable, on their own they're no match for the Chinese armed forces. And both South Korea and Japan lack the ability to truly threaten China anywhere other than right off their own shores. However, working in conjunction with the US, both nations suddenly become a significant threat, but the biggest threat comes from the US assets stationed in their territory. If the war goes poorly, China could gamble that if it starts attacking Filipino, Japanese, and South Korean civilians, they'll pull their support for the US, taking away America's biggest asset in the region, friendly ports and airfields to operate from. This might incentivize China to deliberately target civilian populations, causing as much collateral damage as possible while making it clear China will continue this terror campaign until US forces are no longer present. Borrowing a page from Russia's playbook, China could turn to war crimes as a war-winning strategy. How many dead civilians would it take for the Philippines to declare itself neutral and forbid the US from operating off its territory? 
South Korea in particular could suffer significantly in the case of war because China has one massive ace up its sleeve in any confrontation with the US. North Korea Currently about 50,000 US troops are stationed in South Korea to act as a deterrent versus the North. While the Republic of Korea is a very capable military power, the US is treaty-bound to defend it, and there's reservations about just how successful the ROK military would be on its own against the North. Prioritizing its air and naval forces in recent years means that the Army has received significant budget and personnel cuts, and no number of aircraft or ships are going to hold the line against a million-strong North Korean force, especially when South Korea only has 500,000 active duty members, half of the North. China could exploit a conflict in the Korean Peninsula to consume American and Japanese resources, and it would be its greatest interest to do just that. For the South, this would be devastating. Thousands of North Korean artillery pieces are all within range of Seoul and its suburbs, making one of the most populated cities in the world a giant target. The destruction would be truly immense, with some estimates placing the initial barrage at hundreds of shells a minute, waning over time due to intense South Korean counter-battery fire. But the North is likely to use numerous tricks to deliberately target the South Korean population and its infrastructure. The Kim regime has made it clear civilians would be valid targets in the case of a war, and a war on the peninsula would doubtlessly be preceded by numerous chemical, biological, and possibly even nuclear acts of terrorism in the South. If you've followed our channel, you've seen the numerous ways we've dramatized these attacks being carried out in our fictional Korean War scenarios, and these dramatizations are based on real, projected threats that the US military expects from the North. Acts of nuclear terrorism would be a more guaranteed way for the North to utilize its small nuclear arsenal. With the US, South Korean, and Japanese ballistic missile defenses fully prepared to intercept a North Korean launch, it would be much more efficient to smuggle nuclear weapons into the South and detonate them directly at their targets. These targets would likely be the South's five most important harbors, Busan, Incheon, Donghai, Masan, and Gunsan. Shutting these down and irradiating them would cripple America's attempts to quickly send in reinforcements, forcing it to create makeshift port facilities elsewhere. It would also shut down South Korean trade, inflicting catastrophic damage on its economy and its people who rely on foreign food imports. Food and petroleum in South Korea are their biggest weaknesses, with the nation relying on imports of both. South Korea is one of the most food insecure nations on earth, with one of the lowest food self-sufficiency rates amongst developed nations. In 2020, South Korea's grain self-sufficiency rate was only at 19.3%. Self-sufficiency rates for the most important food items were so low that the government initiated a special plan in 2021 to tackle the nation's food security crisis. Shutting down South Korea's major ports would effectively starve the Korean population of food and the oil they need to drive their economy, creating significant misery and even famine. With port facilities irradiated, it could take weeks for global food relief to arrive, by which time tens of thousands might have already died from starvation alone. And to achieve all this, all the North would have to do is smuggle several nuclear devices aboard fishing vessels and simply pull them into port. Next, though, would be the biological and chemical attacks that the North is likely to carry out against the South civilians. This would include active shelling during the fighting itself, but also preemptive strikes before hostilities are actually declared. North Korean special forces and spies could easily smuggle various agents into the South and disperse them among South Korea's most busy transit hubs. Widespread use of rail travel makes the population extremely susceptible to a biological attack, and various pinpoint attacks at the right stations could take a biological agent into the heart of all of the ROK's largest cities. From there, refugees fleeing the fighting would carry the sickness with them further south, prompting a second crisis. Now go check out our hit fiction series, I Survived 100 Days of Nuclear War, or click this other video instead.